Well, thank you for having uh, myself and Sister Leah out. It's actually the um, first exhort I've done since joining the uh, Riverwood Ecclesia. So it's really weird to say on behalf of our brethren and sisters at Riverwood, um, they send their love and greetings. I don't know if I'm quite able to say that on their behalf just yet, but here we go. I'm sure they do. But before we um, partake of the emblems this morning, I wanted to draw some words of encouragement um, from this little story that we're given in John chapter 2. And specifically the events that occurred at the wedding uh, of Cana. Now, interestingly enough, I actually came across this event while I was studying uh, something else. But then as I was reading these words, I became so intrigued about what was happening in these verses and, and some of the questions that came up for it that I started uh, looking more into the wedding of Cana in itself and the events that occurred uh, therein. And it almost became my undoing because I came out with about five exhortations worth of material, um, but I've managed to cut it down to about three today. So we'll see how we go getting through that. But the reason I was so intrigued and what we'll hopefully uh, come to conclude this morning is that this was the perfect miracle to start Christ's ministry off. And everything about this miracle from the context in John to the people that were involved to the actual miracle that he did, uh, everything just fitted in perfectly with Christ's ministry and it was all perfectly done. And it all started right here in John chapter 2 with what John tells us in verse 11 is Christ's first miracle or his first sign of his ministry. And it started at the wedding of Cana. So rather than going into everything that we can potentially pull out of these verses, because there's so much in them that we'll be able to draw out and apply to ourselves, and there's so much depth to these and tradition and customs that are tied in as well with the Jewish uh, the people, what we're going to look at is the two main themes here, which sort of connect in with each other, which is the marriage and the miracle of the wine and how those two things uh, correlate with each other and bond with each other. And so let's get into it. And look at this miracle in John chapter 2 and verse 1. So John starts off the chapter by saying, And the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Now, straight away, John in the first verse is giving us a big heads up. He's giving us a huge sign that what's about to happen here is a very significant event. And he gives us two heads ups in these verses to grab your attention. Now, the first heads up is that this is happening on the third day. That's something he wants us to note. And if that didn't capture your attention, then he's also going to give us a second big, big heads up. And that's that the mother of Jesus was there at the event. Now, why are these a big heads up? Well, it's because of the symbology and the importance that these two factors have with what they relate to here in the scriptures and what they relate to elsewhere in the scriptures so we'll start with the third day now there's so much speculation over this third day and and what it means and what it relates to what it's referring to so some day some say that this third day is the third day of christ's ministry and some say it's the third day of the week and some say it's the third day since john chapter one started uh, some say it's the third day since leaving galilee but if we look through the verses in John chapter 1, we can actually see that it is three days since it's been started counting there. So in John chapter 1 and verses 1 to 28, we, we can consider that day zero, if you like. That's when it starts. Because in verse 29 of John chapter 21, it says, The next day, and Jesus was baptized that day. So if we keep scrolling through the verses, it comes up again in verse 35 and says the next day. And we see that after then, uh, two disciples of John start to follow Jesus. And if we keep following it through in John chapter 1, eventually we get to verse 43, which says the day following. And Jesus would then go into Galilee that day. So exactly when this third day is specifically referring to, it's, it can be a little bit confusing and a little, little bit ambiguous. But I think that John has almost done that intentionally. John puts it in there that it was the third day as a heads up and he's left it 
intentionally ambiguous, I believe, is because it's not about the fact that it's been three days since something. It's about the fact that it is, in fact, the third day that this wedding is happening on. He wants us to focus on the fact that this happens on the third day. And the reason is because the third day has a lot of significance to us and a lot of symbolism behind it. And so John, from the start of this parable, in the opening sentence, is letting us know, hey, this miracle is also symbolic. It represents and it's standing for something. It is pointing forward to something else that will occur on the third day. And so, of course, we know that Christ was raised on the third day. We also know that Christ will reign on earth in his kingdom for a thousand years during the third millennium, during which time the marriage of the supper, uh, the marriage supper of the lamb will take place. So John deliberately puts this in there that this wedding occurred on the third day so that our minds think instantly, this is deeper than just the story of his epistle. This is pointing forward to those times. It's not just a coincidence that this has happened. It's part of a pattern of things that are occurring on the third day. Now, for those disciples that may have been with Jesus, and for John certainly at this time as he's recording the epistle, he might have thought back to the words of Hosea chapter 6 and verse 2. Because Hosea prophesies in those verses, and he says, Come and let us return unto Yahweh, for he hath torn, and he will heal us. He hath smitten, and he will bind us up. After two days he will revive us. In the third day he will raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. So this was a prophecy that Hosea made and that Christ refers to obviously later on in chapter 2 as well. And it's talking about Israel and its relationship with God and their symbolic marriage that they have. And Hosea, we know, was a symbolic prophet of that marriage and relationship between uh, God and Israel. And the commitment of Israel to God after they had committed adultery against, uh, against him for the idols and for the nations that were all around them. So it's about the reunification of them with him again. And Hosea notes that two days he will revive us and on the third day he will raise us up. Talking about that. But that's not all. There's actually more significance to this wedding day being on the third day. And more depth that John is showing us in this epi epistle to try and show this, the spiritual significance and symbolism as well. Uh, let's just flick back to Exodus chapter 19. So Exodus chapter 19 and verse 1, it says... In the third month, when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt, the same day came they into the wilderness of Sinai. So it's been two months since they've left Egypt. And this is now the third month that they're in the wilderness of Sinai. And if we continue down to verse 5, it says, Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. And Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before their faces all these words which Yahweh commanded them. And all the people answered together and said, All that Yahweh hath spoken, we will do. Now, let's just take a small moment and, and, and remember that phrase that the children of Israel have said there. But continuing on, it says, And Moses returned the words of the people unto Yahweh. And Yahweh said unto Moses, Lo, I come unto thee in a thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak with thee and believe thee forever. And Moses told the words of the people unto Yahweh. And Yahweh said unto Moses, Go unto the people and sanctify them today. And tomorrow, and let them wash their clothes, and be ready against the third day. For the third day, Yahweh will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. And if we keep reading on in that chapter, in verses 16 to 17, we see that God did come down onto Mount Sinai. And there was, there was trumpets that were sounding, there was light and thunder, and the people were actually terrified uh, to go up and to present themselves uh, to God and to meet with him. But on that third day, 
God and Israel were symbolically married together. They entered into a covenant together. And John alludes to this and to Hosea's prophecy and everything that these events will point forward to in the future when this covenant, uh, when this covenant entered into would last eternity. Uh, and by extension, we will be invited into that covenant as well uh, with God. And so when we read then in John chapter 2 or this in John chapter 2, we can't rule out the importance of this miracle and what it will mean for us in the future as well. Um, and just to touch on lastly as well, something a little bit or that you might find interesting. Um, even tradi traditionally and still to this day, a lot of Jewish people try to get married uh, on the third day, which I, I think might be a Tuesday or something, which is a very inconvenient day um, for most people to get married on on a random day. But um, they have a little weird reasoning behind it, which is that the idea comes from Genesis chapter 1. Uh, and we won't go there, but you can have a look. But from Genesis chapter 1, verse 9 to 13, it's the third day of creation. And on that day, God separates the land from the sea. And when he looks at what he's done, he says that it was good. And then in verse 12, God makes the plants bring forth vegetation. And after he sees them bring forth, forth their fruit, he says that it was also good. And so the Jews see this as a double blessing because on the third day, God said that it was good twice. Uh, and so it's twice as blessed as any other day. And so naturally that means that they need to get married on a Tuesday because it's double the blessings uh, as, as anyone else. And so it just shows, again, the absolute traditions and customs um, that, these, that these people had, that they get married on the third day for a double blessing. So that's the first heads up that John gives us, that it was the third day. Now, the second is this phrase that the mother of Jesus was there. Now, John doesn't call her Mary. He refers to her as the mother of Jesus. Um, and that there's perhaps a couple of reasons why that is so. Perhaps it's to keep the focus on Jesus at this time rather than uh, calling her Mary. Perhaps it's because he was charged with her care but at this stage she was still Jesus's mother uh, and he wants to point that out but what is important is that Mary's presence is only recorded one other time in the epistle of John her presence is only noted on two occasions in John firstly here and the only other time she's noted is when Jesus is on the cross and that's in John chapter 19 if we'll just flick across there really quick It's John chapter 19 uh, and verse 25 to 26. He says, Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Cleophas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour... That disciple took her unto his own home. So John mentioning Mary's presence, and I say her presence because uh, her name itself is mentioned one other time in the epistle, but it's when people ask, um, is this Jesus the son of Mary? So Mary's presence isn't actually there and she's not doing anything. Uh, she's only referred to, but it's still important to know because what John is doing here at the start of John 2 is He's tying this event, he's sort of bookmarking the event that happens here in John chapter 2 um, with the events of the cross later on in the chapter. And so he's drawing a connection between those two times by noting the presence of Mary there. So in John chapter 2 verse 1, John then notes that it was the third day and that Mary the mother of Jesus was there. He's trying, trying to indicate that this was an event of spiritual significance. So let's keep reading in John chapter 2, uh, verses 1 to 3. It says, uh, sorry, well, we've just read verse 1, but from verse 2 it says, And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, They have no wine. So we'll put a little bit of context on this situation because it's perhaps a bit more drastic and deep than just saying, well, they ran out of wine. Weddings, 
themselves were big. They were massive events. And, and from, from where Cana is, Cana is a small town. It's right next to Nazareth. It was very close to each other, relatively speaking, basically next door. Uh, so it makes sense that Jesus and his mother would be invited uh, to the wedding. Everyone would probably know each other in the town. It's more of a, and, but Cana was small. It was probably more of a town uh, or a village than a, than a city as such. But we know from John chapter 21, verse 2, that Nathaniel, one of Christ's disciples, was from Cana uh, as well. But weddings were these massive events that everyone looked forward to then. Um, life back then, I don't want to say that it's not hard now, but it was very physically demanding back then. You worked hard to make food to provide for your family, and essentially if there was any extra, you would sell that to make money to live, uh, to get by. But unlike or slightly different to Western culture, in Jewish culture, it was actually the groom's responsibility to provide everything for the wedding ceremony, not necessarily the, the brides, as it is um, probably more so typically speaking um, in Western culture. But it was his responsibility to make sure that everything was supplied and catered for and that the wedding had all the necessary provisions available. Now, the bride and groom would effectively be engaged for about a year uh, while he prepared everything. And then after that year of betrothal, the groom would then go with his entourage uh, to the bride's house or the, the fiance's house and would say that everything is re ready, all the preparations have been made, and then they'd go to the wedding together. But it was the groom's responsibility to prepare everything for the, for the wedding. Uh, thank goodness that's not the same as uh, nowadays, but... <laughs> So, yeah. But here in John chapter 2, the wine runs out. And if it ran out, or if anything in general was lacking, it represented and symbolized that the husband wasn't prepared. And it reflected then on the character of the husband that he did not have all that was necessary to supply or to provide for the bride. Now, to us, it's, it's not that big of a deal. Like, you run out of food, you run out of drinks, we go to the store, uh, we get some more. It doesn't matter. But to the Jews and even to some Arabs, Arab nations, it's reflective of what you are like as a person uh, in that sense. It meant that you as a person was lacking. But also to guess, travel wasn't as easy as it is now. You had to walk and walk and walk to get to the destination that you're going to. That meant that you had to give up work and oversight and income for a couple of days for your family and for your household whilst you attended this event. So to attend a small wedding in Cana, you had to set your affairs in order. You had to make sure that everything would keep running while you were gone. And so something just a couple of kilometers would make away would mean that you literally had to take off days to travel there, days to attend the event, and then days again to travel back again. So you can imagine then getting all of that, getting there, and then they run out of food or drink. Um, to people that steeped in tradition and custom, it's almost disrespectful to the guests of the wedding. You also didn't typically travel outside of your family clan. And so to imagine the shame and embarrassment then that would be reflected here on the groom's ability to provide, and everyone would know and you would have to live with that then afterwards. So imagine when the word goes out to Mary then that there's no more wine. We've ran out. Well, it's an embarrassment. And Mary takes it to Jesus. Now, to note in these verses, Joseph isn't mentioned here. We don't know where Joseph is at this point in, 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 in Christ's life, but we can possibly safely assume that he's passed away or something at this stage. Because Mary turns for help to the person that's responsible for the household, for her household. Uh, and, and it's Christ who's supporting their family. And that man is, is Jesus, who she's depended on for a while, which makes sense. Um, it also makes sense that if you've possibly spent the last 30 years living with the wisest and most spiritually knowledgeable person to ever exist, that you'd also turn to them uh, if you have an issue. But just a little side note here. We don't know what capacity Mary has at this wedding. It wasn't Mary's problem that the wine ran out. It was her problem in so much as if she wanted wine, she wasn't getting any. Um, but it wasn't Mary's responsibility to make sure that the wine was topped up and stocked. 
But Mary took it on herself and stepped up. She took someone else's problem to Jesus and Jesus sorted it for her. And I think we, we need to take a little moment just to appreciate that, that Mary sees a problem and rather than say, well, that's their problem, then their responsibility, she takes it to Jesus in the most literal sense that you can. And if we look at this scene from a high angle lens, the people, the bride, the groom, they don't even know that a problem has, has, has occurred at this stage. And yet Mary has said, I will take this problem to Jesus and, and Jesus might fix this problem. And it's because of Mary that Mary did something that this problem actually was resolved ultimately. And so brothers and sisters, it's never not our problem if something comes up. We can take any issue to God or Christ, no matter how big or how small, or whether it's even considered our problem or not. And you might just fix someone else's problem without them realizing. And so that's what Mary does. She looks to Jesus and she says, they have no wine. Now, Jesus responds with an unusual question back. He says in verse 4, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Uh, or as Young's literal translation puts it, uh, Woman, um, no, sorry, as Young's literal puts it, What to me and to thee, woman? Mine hour is not yet come. And so Jesus responds back with what seems like an unusual question and a follow-up comment. Now, some people uh, seem to have an issue with the use of the word woman here by Christ, referring to Mary. But it needs to be understood that this word woman, when he's referring to his mother, it was a title that was used and not seen as Jesus trying to degrade Mary at some time. And when Christ was on the cross on the verge of death, as we remember in, in John chapter 19, verse 26, the only other reference to Mary in these scriptures, he looks to his mother to ensure that she is taken care of and, and, and that he as the supporter and the caregiver of the, of the family will, will no longer be around. So he looks at Mary and he says, woman, behold thy son, referring to John. So he uses the same title and word here when he wants to make sure that his mother and the family are taken care of and addresses Mary by the title of woman. So it's not disrespectful uh, as we might see it nowadays from, uh, I guess, from some points of view. It's just the title that was used. But after saying this to a woman, what have I to do with thee? He adds something else in that his hour is not yet come. So he somehow links the lack of wine at this wedding that he is a guest of and what Mary has said to him to his hour is not yet come, which seems a bit of a strange connection. How does running out of wine mean that your hour has come? Well, if that isn't strange enough, Mary then hears this response, turns to the servants and says, whatsoever he says unto you, do it. And so once again, in this conversation, John is actually showing that there is something more going on in these verses. Something is being implied here. And, and you'd have to think that if you're anyone that's listening into this conversation, you're thinking, what on earth is going on here? Christ refers to his hour is not yet come. Well, what hour is Christ talking about? He's talking about the hour of the messianic banquet, the feast that he will share with his saints in his kingdom. Christ is referring to the hour when the bridegroom and the bride are reunited that Hosea prophesied about and that he would show the covenant of Exodus 19 being fulfilled and completed, the union of God and spiritual Israel. Now we read about this feast in a couple of places in the Old Testament. Uh, let's just look up one in Isaiah chapter 25. So Isaiah 25 and from verse 6 to 9, it says, And in this mountain shall Yahweh of armies make unto all people a feast of fat things, a feast of wines on the lees, a fat things full of marrow of wines on the lees well refined. And he will destroy in this mountain the face of the covering cast over all people and a veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death in victory 
And Yahweh Elohim will wipe away tears from off all faces, and the rebuke of his people shall he take away from off all the earth, for Yahweh hath spoken it. And it shall be said in that day, Lo, this is our God, we have waited for him, and he will save us. This is Yahweh, we have waited for him, we will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. So this is the feast that Jesus says to Mary, it's not there yet. My hour is not yet come. I am not the bridegroom just yet. He also alludes to it in, his, um, in a parable in Matthew chapter 22, verse 2, where he says, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son. So Christ as the Messiah will institute this feast with all the saints from all the nations, and death will be swallowed up, and there will be no more sins. But in this context of Mary knowing who Jesus is, in a first century wedding banquet, Mary could be, or could perhaps be implicitly suggesting that Christ reveals who he is as the Messiah, or proposes or insinuates that Christ institutes the messianic banquet here, which makes sense when Christ says, my hour is not yet come. Now, you might think that's a bit vague and a bit of a stretch, or she's just asking Christ to help out uh, and give the bride and groom a hand to say my hour isn't come yet, um, but link that to the Messianic feast and revealing Christ as, as the Messiah uh, is a bit of a stretch. But I believe that is what John is trying to show us. And John will give us more connections because if we look at what happens next, Mary turns to the servants and says, whatsoever he tells you to do, do it. Now, she doesn't address Christ here after he tells her this, but the servants. And the word she uses to them is to have echoes to something that we've read previously or that, that we asked to note in the back of your head as we're reading it. Because to me, it sounds like Mary's almost echoing or repeating the words of Exodus chapter 19 and verse 8, where it says, And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord hath spoken, we will do. And so we compare that to Mary's response to the servants in John chapter 2 and verse 5 when she says, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And so we can see in this the importance and spiritual significance of this miracle and in the symbology of the marriage and the wedding feast that we are looking forward to as well. Well, as opportunity would have it, there is something else that comes out in these verses that is by no means a coincidence, which again, makes this the perfect miracle to start Christ's ministry. And it is that of all the things to be lacking or imperfect about this wedding, of all the things to go, on, to, to go wrong so that Christ could give the increase or that Christ could show that he is the Messiah and the Deliverer, it was that it was the wine specifically that ran out. Now, wine was a symbol of God's blessings, and there's, there's plenty of places we can go to look at. Um, Psalm 104 verse 15 uh, and Proverbs 3 verse 10, if you'd like, are both just quick examples that show that man is blessed uh, in, a, in, in both occasions by having wine or by God giving man wine. It's symbolic that man has been blessed. So by having wine, it was a symbol of blessing. But more than that, and what Mary is perhaps suggesting is that the abundance of wine is the symbol of the kingdom age. The abundance of wine was symbolic of life in the kingdom age. There's two verses, um, I'm, I'm not sure how we're going for time, but um, I'll read them out. Joel 3 verse 18 says, It shall come to pass in that day that the mountains shall drop down new wine, and that the hills shall flow with milk, and all the rivers of Judah shall flow with waters, and a fountain shall come forth out of the house of the Lord, and shall water the valley of Shittim. And Amos 9, verse 14 to 15 is the other one. It says, I will bring again the captivity of my people of Israel, and they shall build the way cities and inhabit them, inhabit them, and they shall plant vineyards and drink the wine thereof. They shall also make gardens and eat the fruit of them, and I will plant them upon their land, and they shall no more be pulled up out of their land, which I have given them, saith the Lord thy God. So in both of these passages, we're given a glimpse of what the kingdom will look like. And it is that the nations will be blessed with abundance. And so Mary, in seeing the lack of wine, thinks this is an opportunity 
for Christ to provide, for him to be the Messiah and show that the wedding banquet is now. There's one more passage that we'll look at, uh, that we'll, I'll, I'll get you to turn there, which is in Genesis chapter 49. Because in Genesis chapter 49, it will absolutely solidify, uh, solidify this connection. Genesis chapter 49 is Jacob giving his blessings to his son, uh, sons. And in verse 8 to 12, he gives, his, he gives Judah his blessings. And he says this in verses 10 to 12 there. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. And unto him shall the gathering of people be, binding his foal unto the vine and his ass's colt unto the choice vine. He washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. His eyes shall be red with wine and his teeth white with milk. So what Jacob is saying in these verses, it's actually a prophecy of sorts and a blessing that there will be a king coming from Judah. The scepter shall not depart from Judah. And with that king, there'll be such a blessing and such an abundance of wine and fertility in the land that you'll be able to tie your colt to the best vines. Uh, so you've got so much good vines that you can just tie your colt up to them. He can eat them or, or trample them, whatever. And it won't matter because you've got so many of them. Um, that they'll have so much wine that they could wash their clothes in wine. The blessings are overflowing when this king comes. And so now here is Christ at this wedding on the third day with his disciples. And the servants are instructed, whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And so Christ provides the wine. But not only does he provide the wine, he provides an abundance of it. Now, I'd love to go into the depth and detail of these water pots and their traditions and their meanings because they're also so relevant and sig significant that it's amazing. Uh, but unfortunately, um, that would also be boring for a lot of people as well. But here is Christ at this wedding and he provides an abundance of wine. Now, it'll say the water pots in some translations have two to three firkins. For some, it'll say about 20 to 30 gallons. It's actually about the same uh, amount. But in total, Christ creates about 120 to 180 gallons worth of wine because he asked for these water pots to be fil uh, filt filled, filled up to the brim. Um, and doing the math, that is the equivalent of about 600 to 900 modern day bottles of wine. Now, I'm not sure how many people would be at this wedding. As I mentioned, Cana was actually a fairly small town but 900 bottles of wine is a ridiculous amount of wine to have. And if you're getting, I, I looked it up, you get five glasses per bottle. So you're averaging four and a half thousand glasses of wine uh, at this smelly, fairly small Cana town. And so even though Christ was not instituting the marriage supper here, he was showing that he was the Messiah through the one prophesied in Genesis to come, through the abundance of wine provided at this wedding. And he showed that he was the ultimate bridegroom that has prepared and provided for those at the wedding and for the bride. And something that I think is also pretty, really nice about this miracle is, is, is the way it was done in that the last deliverer that the people had was Moses. He delivered them from the Egyptians and he brought them out of Egypt and he made that covenant with them in Exodus chapter 19, that commitment with them to be married to God, where he was the mediator of that. Well, here Christ, is, op, took, Christ took this opportunity here to show that he was the greater deliverer, that he was the greater prophet than Moses and that he was the Messiah. And Moses gave a sign to the people that he was there on behalf of God, that he was their deliverer that he was their mediator. If you remember what the first plague was that Moses showed to the Egyptians and to the Israelites that he would deliver them from Egypt and take them into the land promised, the first plague was turning the water 
into blood. Water into blood was the first plague. But Jesus didn't come to bring death. He came to bring life. So blood was the price they had to pay under the law of Moses. But under Christ, it's association and life through wine, not death by blood. And so whereas the first deliverer and the first covenant were shown in the water turning into blood, this new covenant that Christ brings in and institutes is water into wine, into a blessing and into an abundance of blessings that he will bring. And so even though his exact hour has not yet come, Christ turns water into wine. He shows that he is the deliverer who has come to save Israel and to save all of us by extension. He made an abundance to show that the kingdom age was at hand and that in his life you would see a reflection of what God has in store for all those who are called. And that's how he starts his missionary journey. And so now as we look to the emblems before us, brothers and sisters, let's be excited and encouraged for that age to come, encouraged that we are looking forward to that day where we can partake again of the wine and the abundant blessings with our Lord. At the Last Supper, Jesus told his servants, the disciples, that he wouldn't, he wouldn't drink of that cup again until he drank it new with them in his Father's kingdom. And how much do we look forward to that time, hoping that every emblem we take will be the last that we take before we take it with him. Before we conclude, let's just take one last thought from these verses. Because of all, all the people that were at this wedding, the bride and the groom, the guests, the governor of the feast, the friends and family, the princes of the town, the chiefs of the synagogue, whoever, whoever might have been invited, who were the only people to see and experience this miracle? It was the servants. It was those who weren't even invited to the wedding, or at least not as a guest. It was those who served the others at the feast who saw this miracle. And John in verse 9 almost doubled downs on the point to bring it out to the reader that the governor of the feast didn't see the signs of the Messiah coming, but it was the servants that did. And so the biggest reveal of the Messiah, the sign, the sign that would point forward to the messianic feast and the blessings that would be in store for all those who are accounted to be the bride of Christ, and it was for the lowest there that would get to see it. And the ones that saw it weren't the ones that were originally invited to that wedding. Now, brothers and sisters, we have such an incredible opportunity to be there in that day. And the scriptures point out to us the signs of his coming, the signs of what the Messiah will bring. And it shows us signs of what the kingdom age will be like. So let's be astute in looking for them. So this first miracle performed by Christ was the perfect start to his ministry, a, a miracle that represented all that God offers to us, a seat at the table with him and an abundance of blessings, joyous occasions, death swallowed up in victory and tears wiped from our faces, being planted in that land never to be pulled up again. So we'll just close with the words of Revelation chapter 19 and verse 6 to 9. It says, And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice, and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come. And his wife hath made herself ready, and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. He saith unto me, these are the true sayings of God.